Uh, well, um, my name is John Major Jenkins, and I've been studying and researching the Maya cosmology and calendar for about 25 years. My interest was stimulated by my early trips to Central America, traveling on a shoestring in the mid-1980s and uh, uh, visiting with Maya people, uh, going to the temple sites, and my interest quickly developed into trying to figure out the unresolved questions in Maya cosmology, and one of the big questions was the uh, 2012 date. So my approach to 2012 is to reconstruct the original authentic teachings and ideas associated with this date by the people who created the 2012 calendar. So there's a, a wide spectrum of ideas in the 2012 marketplace, and uh, uh, my sincere, committed uh, approach is to uh, study deeply the Maya traditions themselves and to just do a good old-fashioned reconstruction on what this, uh, what this 2012 calendar, the long count calendar, was about in its original formulation. We have a, a great legacy from these incredible culture of the Mayans. We have their temples and pyramids and we have uh, interesting things they said, but perhaps the, the, the most important and interesting thing we have at the moment is the calendar. So, uh, where did it come from? Well, uh, I believe that it was formulated about 2,100 years ago in the, in the context of the Azapan culture, or the Azapan civilization. The terminology around cultural change is, is a bit murky, in my opinion. You know, uh, the Olmec people uh, lived uh, some 3,000 years ago. And in that region where the Olmec lived, there was a lot of changes that happened, and culture morphed in different ways. And in that region, in the Isthmian region, in Chiapas there that runs along the Pacific coast, uh, there was a lot of uh, cultural experimentation that happened. The site of Izapa, and I believe that the site of Izapa is responsible for the formulation of the long count cosmology, and I kind of make a distinction between the cosmology and the calendar because I think that the, uh, the cosmology came first. In other words, the astronomers realized that there was going to be a future convergence between the December solstice sun and the dark rift in the Milky Way. That became a very potent mythological idea that they very quickly formulated into this creation mythology story about the future rebirth of the father of the hero twins and how that happens. Uh, the father of the hero twins being a symbol for the December solstice sun that would get reborn at the end of the cycle. Now, the scientific endeavor of calculating precession, which had to go along with that, I think came a little bit later. So uh, we have sites like Takalik Aba, which is very close to Azapa. And I think that uh, the Long Count calendar itself uh, probably uh, arose... In one of these sites, it's hard to really nail it down, but I think the, the, the challenge was on to calculate precession accurately enough so that they could project a certain number of years into the future when they would uh, calculate this alignment happening, and I believe that that became the long count calendar, the 13 Bakhtun cycle. And that end date was then used in this very profound paradigm of the creation mythology about the uh, future uh, rebirth of the sun and the world. So the mythology they created is, is, is not just a, a kind of a story to you know, add some substance to their culture. It's actually, uh, 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 how do you say, it, it's, a, it's mm, what was well, it was, it was, it was part of a, it was a part of like a calendrical astrotheology. So there were teachings in, embedded in it that involved religion, mythology, and astronomy. So it's really fascinating how they did that. And, 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 and the fact that the creation myth is, f appears on the 60 carved monuments of Azapa, uh, and you have that the ball court at Azapa is lined up with the December solstice sunrise. I think all these things, uh, to me, really uh, suggest very strongly that Azapa was the place where uh, a lot of this gelled. Um, so the calendar that they created, uh, not a lot of people know a lot about it, but we know that it exists. So. We have a calendar that works 365 and a quarter days. You know that that's what we what we have, um, and we have a leap year and you know, whatever it works. Um, so the Mayan calendar, 
was it more accurate than ours? Was it less accurate than ours? Was it primitive? I mean, how, how, how did that work? Well, the Maya calendar um, could be very accurate. Uh, there, there was a, uh, an ability of the Maya to do calendars in an accurate way that reflected the astronomy, but it's a bit counterintuitive how they achieved that. They worked with whole numbers, basically, so they always had to find the, the commensuration between uh, calendar cycles and whole number intervals. So, for example, with the, uh, the true tropical year, which is 365.2422 days, uh, they didn't work with fractions, so what they did is they noticed when calendar cycles would commensurate. So there's this thing called the year drift formula, in which uh, 1,507 of these true tropical years equal exactly 1,508 hob of 365 days. So they found how the hob commensurates with the tropical year, and this year drift formula of some 1,500 years then is used for a very, very accurate uh, um, calculation of the true tropical year. But the thing that I always like to say is that, yes, they could be accurate, but that really wasn't the main emphasis in their cosmology or thinking. What they were looking for was the grand commensuration of cycles. You know, they were interested in, not only in that, but in how different domains related to each other. Domains of agriculture, domains of human psychology, domains of the sky, uh, how all these different uh, domains of human experience could be seen interfacing as one grand whole picture. So accuracy, sure, they could be accurate, but they were more interested in this kind of grand holistic vision. And also cycles. I mean, if they're, if they're tying everything in in terms of actons and all of these kind of things, it's about cycles. Yeah, well, once they create the framework of the long count, then you have all kinds of cyclic repetitions in the Venus cycle or eclipses. So the long count then becomes an almanac or a framework in which these patterns in these different astronomical events could be tracked. So, um, you know, the reason we, uh, we the, the Mayan calendar is famous to us today and the reason why we care about it is because they have this idea of uh, you know, a great ending of the cycle in December 21st, 2012. Mm -hmm. So why did they pinpoint December 21st, 2012, and uh, what did they think about it? Oh, great. Yeah, well, according, according to my research, uh, the reason why they pinpointed this date, it's a solstice, so it probably has something to do with astronomy, and there's some intentionality behind it. That was the vector for me uh, back around 1990 in investigating this. Uh, to cut to the chase, and according to my research, there is a rare uh, astronomical alignment that's culminating in the years around 2012. It's caused by the precession of the equinoxes. Uh, precession causes the equinoxes and the solstices to shift backwards along the ecliptic. And in the years around 2012, the position of the December solstice will be lined up with the bright band of the Milky Way, specifically a part that is visible to the naked eye astronomers called the dark rift. So the galactic alignment is the alignment of the December solstice sun with the dark rift in the Milky Way. And this is a fact of astronomy that happens in the years around 2012. So my work really goes, you know, it's one thing to sort of point this out, this coincidence between the galactic alignment happening in the years around 2012. Uh, but what I did is I showed how the astronomical features involved in this alignment are front and center in the creation mythology. The dark rift is an important feature in the Maya creation myth. It's, <clears throat> it's referenced as a Shabalba Bay, the road to the underworld. It's also referred to as the black road. So I found that the galactic alignment is encoded into traditions like the ball game and king-making rites. And now we have uh, this monument six from Tortuguero which contains 13 dates, and uh, the pattern of dates and the, and the connections between the dates, it contains the 2012 date on it as well, uh, definitely point to an awareness of the solstice sun lining up with the dark rift in 2012. So that's, uh, that's why they picked the date, and how they thought about it <coughs> is found in their creation myth. The creation mythology kind of goes hands in hand with the long count calendar. And uh, in the creation mythology, and, and generally speaking, uh, even among the modern Maya today, they treat period endings as times of transformation and renewal. So this idea that 2012 is some kind of dramatic doomsday apocalypse really seems to be more of a projection of, of, of the Western literal Judeo-Christian mind into this tradition that was basically 
about cyclic time philosophy. And, and the Maya really do see the ends of cycles as times of uh, transformation and renewal. But it's, not, it's never predetermined. You know, that you have to, if you want to go deep into the creation mythology teachings, it's as deep and profound as anything you find in the Egyptian material, and you're rewarded by going deep into a study of the material. Um, so the, the idea of doomsday is something that we've made up. It's not something the Mayans actually talked about. It. <clears throat> well, it's, it's definitely something that's been projected unduly onto 2012. I mean, I like to go to the core of the tradition, which I believe is basically in the ball court at the site of Izapa uh, some 2,100 years ago. And the carved monuments there definitely tell us how the originators of this long count cosmology thought about 2012. So conclusion, transformation, and renewal. But throughout Mesoamerican history and Mayan history, you are going to find examples, just like you'll find in any tradition, a whole spectrum of ideas that accrete around a certain idea, especially something like a, a huge cycle ending. And in the World Age Doctrine, which is very central to the Popol Vuh creation myth, you can have uh, sort of a more literal interpretation of what is entailed in a, in a period ending, uh, which would be more dramatic and sensationalized, something that you would uh, maybe present to a certain sector of the society. But then the deeper part of the tradition and the ide ideation around it, uh, I think, uh, always involves the challenge of successfully facilitating a transformation and renewal. So that's kind of what I, I like to focus on in my talks. Okay. Well, I mean, one thing with this galactic center alignment and going into the dark rift is the dark rift for them represented a caiman and the jaws of a, you know, an mm -hmm. alligator. And yeah. we're actually going to be lining up with, into the jaws of the alligator. Right. Now, uh, you know, in the jaws of an alligator, sure. it sounds like death. Uh, right. Uh, well, death and rebirth go together. So that's the deeper part of the teaching is that uh, one has to um, go through the gauntlet in a sense. One has to go, to go through hell to get to heaven. Or the jaws represent actually a, a transformational process, devouring transformation. And... Uh, uh, or going through the underworld, really, because the jaws represent the dark rift, which is the portal to the underworld. So the successful transformation requires going through the underworld journey to arise on, through it and get through it and be reborn on the other side. So, yes, there is uh, definitely in the symbology uh, an integration of death and rebirth imagery. Well, it's an incredible synchronicity that uh, we're going to be lining up with part of the sky that actually looks like that, and that seems to be what's happening right now. Anyway, uh, in your talk, you're, you're suggesting that um, when someone is being born, they go through what seems like a doomsday. That, you know, when, mm -hmm. when you're being born, it's a painful, horrible, terrible experience, and you think the world is ending. Maybe you mm -hmm. can talk about that. Later. Sure, there's a, a process of uh, psychological experience that is definitely mapped onto the intrauterine environment, and the, the process of embryogenesis, and then especially the, uh, the process of birthing. And uh, Stanislav Grof has talked about this beautifully in his uh, four phases of the birth process. And uh, one of them is fraught with uh, horrific imagery and scenery and, and feelings of, of, of the uterine walls constricting, and it feels like a certain doom and apocalypse is happening. I mean... Stan, who was uh, going to be here at the conference with us, uh, he's just written beautifully about this. And one thing that we can point out is that it would map very nicely on to 2012, and, and to the extent that 2012 represents a kind of a collective rebirthing process. And how do people deal with that? How do people think about that? And how do people interact with that kind of archetype of a, a rebirth archetype or an end-of-cycle archetype? Well, there's probably going to fall into four basic categories depending on the psychological uh, situation of the person involved. I think that a, a fair number of people, especially in our society, are sort of stuck in that, uh, that phase two of the process in which it's, it seems horrific. You know, they're stuck. You know, is there any exit from this situation? You know, the birth canal hasn't opened up fully yet. And, and I think that that's where a lot of people are stuck with this 2012 thing. But if the process can be uh, gone through and allowed to happen, 
without completely freaking out, then there's a new birth awaiting at the end of the process. And that's the, that's the psychological stage that I think uh, we need to sort of like focus on and talk about, that uh, the universe is trying to evolve us in a sense, and we have to allow that to happen. It's not so much something that we do, but something that we open up to, like opening up to the great mystery and allowing this process to happen. Is this something that needs to happen? I mean, what, how do you see the state of the world right now? What, what happens if there is no 2012 or there is no 2012? Oh, there probably won't be. Whatever happens is going to be uh, an indication as to uh, what our society as a whole can do with uh, a moment of, of great potential change and transformation. You know, Is it going to be positive change or negative change? I'm not really an advocate for using 2012 as some kind of alarm clock. Uh, mainly, I have been interested in reconstructing these ideas in Maya cosmology. And I would say that from the Maya point of view, 2012 does offer a great opportunity for transformation and renewal, but it does require uh, a willing, conscious sacrifice, basically sacrifice of illusions, the kind of illusions that keep us stuck to planes of limitation in our consciousness. So, you know, it's a tricky thing because uh, you're sort of forced to wear many hats, you know, when you talk about 2012, addressing the spiritual side of things. And I've been particularly focused on a more academic reconstruction, but I'm happy to talk about these spiritual principles that you find in the perennial philosophy that you also find in the Maya creation mythology and we're stuck with 2012. It apparently seems to be the sticky paper for a lot of different ideas. And I think that, you know, it probably can uh, be used as a trigger point for some kind of collective change, for the better, I would hope. You know, so, so since we have it, you know, we might as well be focused on how to facilitate the best kind of transformation possible. But I don't, I don't really think of the day itself as being particularly important. In fact, Probably, I mean, my suspicion is that the day itself is going to be kind of the filter that a lot of the negative media silliness is going to get stuck in. And what makes it through the filter is the good stuff. You know, it's like separating the wheat from the chaff. So, um, yeah, that's, I, that's kind of the way I think about it. Okay, well, let's get a foundation on this. First of all, what is exactly galactic alignment theory? Uh, yeah, well, the galactic alignment theory uh, is a theory that proposes that the ancient Maya intended this rare astronomical alignment uh, to uh, target the... Well, let me say this another way. Uh, the galactic alignment theory basically proposes that the, the December 21st, 2012 end date of the 13 Bakhtun cycle was intended to target this rare astronomical alignment, which referred to as a galactic alignment. It's a real astronomical event. It happens in the years around 2012. It's caused by the precession of the equinoxes. It's when the December solstice sun lines up with the great band of the Milky Way galaxy, specifically the dark rift in the Milky Way. So the galactic alignment is an alignment of the December solstice sun with the dark rift in the Milky Way. And this had great significance, I believe, the way that I've reconstructed how this alignment was utilized by the Maya in their creation mythology and their ballgame symbolism. It basically is very simple. It just says that uh, this is the reason why the Maya picked 2012. And then reconstructing the belief system around it is not too far behind you find it in the creation mythology that uh, the Maya thought of cycle endings as times of transformation and renewal. Now with the galactic alignment, I'm not saying that it definitely causes certain empirical effects. You know, that's a common misconception in my work. I think that astronomers and astrophysicists should probably look into it. I mean, we don't really know. It hasn't been examined scientifically. Do we have any, any information about what happens when we align up with the galactic center? I mean, do we know what happened 26,000 years ago, the last time? Do we have any uh, geological... Well, I don't, I don't think... I'm not really well versed in that, so I, I'm not sure if I can comment on that. But uh, we do know that precession is related to ice ages. It's not as simple as just once every 26,000 years we get an ice age. There's more complex variables involved in this. I guess my speculation or suspicion is that if the galactic alignment does somehow affect 
life on Earth, it might operate more quickly than something as slow as geological changes. I think that the, just the image itself could be equally powerful as a transformative uh, uh, image. This idea that we're lining up with the dark rift in the Milky Way, which happens to be located in the bright bulge of the galactic center. So uh, the bright, uh, the, the, the nuclear bulge of the galactic center um, could be seen as this transformative nexus, you know, reconnecting with the womb of creation, you know, human beings getting back in touch with their deep uh, nurturing selves, you know, that kind of thing. Well, with this 2012 transformation where we, where we do you know, reconnect with our nurturing selves, would that be caused by aligning with the galactic center, or would that just be like astrology, some sort of a kind of synchronous mirror of, of an entire chain? I think that the Maya connected the two things together because they saw the different realms as being interwoven. So one might call that astrology, but I think there's a lot of misconceptions around astrology as having to involve uh, empirical cause and effect influence. I think there's a deeper interweaving that happens between the two, the two realms of the subjective realm of human experience and the objective realm that we see unfolding in the planets in astronomical cycles. Uh, some people see the connection between these two realms, and I've languaged this in one of my books as kind of like a more expanded definition of the term synchronicity. Uh, I tend to think of uh, the as above, so below principle operating also in the realm of um, the human microcosm reflects the macrocosm, and also the subjective domain is unfolding in tandem with the objective domain. Not because there's some kind of uh, cause and effect uh, communication going on between them, but because they both emerge from the same place. So they're unfolding with the same rhythm. And that's why we see similar patterns and rhythms un unfolding in the sky or in the processes of uh, collective, un -human un uh, collective human unfolding. Interesting. So this would uh, imply human free will and uh, our choices are somehow associated with this transformation. It's not simply the galactic line. Yeah, I, I, it's kind of like the idea that, uh, you know, there are tangible things that we can predict in the uh, physical world, you know, especially like things with astronomy, you know. The Maya predicted, in my, according to my work, that this future alignment would happen in the same way we can say that the sun will rise tomorrow, but you have to choose to wake up, in a sense. You have to choose to get out of bed. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm an advocate for human free will choice in these things, and I think that in the perennial philosophy teachings, and I think also illustrated in the Maya creation mythology, is that there, is, there are moments and times of maximized opportunity for transformation and renewal, and the Maya would say that those happen at uh, cycle endings, and those cycle endings, like the one in 2012, are connected to astronomy. But we have to make the human free will choice to sacrifice something. And that is paradoxically uh, the sacrifice of our uh, uh, illusions, the illusions of ego construct that keep us stuck to planes of limitation. I think that all of the world's great religious traditions have this idea at their core that we need to, you know, sacrifice is the core. And that's kind of a hot-button term. You know, we might think of it as surrender or something like that. But still, it's, it's somewhat paradoxical, but I think it's essential that uh, we engage ourselves with uh, the process of uh, transformation by sort of throwing ourselves into the fire, you know, throwing ourselves into, uh, into the process that will end up in uh, transforming our Identities. You know, it's all about the relationship between ego and uh, what you might call the divine self, the eternal, infinite soul source consciousness. And uh, in my belief, it's, it has to do with uh, putting ego back into right relationship with that true divine self. Well, the mind's pinpointed this time, uh, 2012, and uh, f f f is the opportunity to do that. And it seems that what's happening in the world right now is it's, it's the right time. Now, 
Um, <coughs> we have this word prophecy, the mind prophecy, the end of the world prophecy. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems what you're saying is that it's not a prophecy. It's more about a kind of science of, 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 of it's not like gazing into a crystal ball or something. Like yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's so easy to conflate uh, prophecy with Nostradamus or great gazing into a crystal ball or something like that. There's a lot of that that goes on in the 2012 discussion where the 2012 material and the Maya material isn't really being dealt with on its own terms. There's a lot of projection of Western ideas into this. Or just superficial ideas or interpretations of, say, for example, what prophecy is. What is prophecy? Well, I think that prophecy is not so much predicting future events in some kind of predetermined way. You hear that a lot. You hear that terminology a lot. This will happen. That will happen. And I, I think people that are doing that are sort of like, I call them predictators, because they're <laughs> using this terminology that presumes that the future is already out there just waiting to happen. Well, if that's true, we're just unconscious automatons. And I guess if you are an unconscious automaton, then your future is basically predetermined. But if we're going to exercise our right as free will beings, then we have the ability to evoke the future, and I think prophecy can be more like an evocation of a possible future. So we can choose to evoke the highest possible future or the lowest possible future, and those are basically the prophets of doom. So again, this isn't actually a prophecy. It's more, it's a scientific uh, cycle or something like that. How do you yeah, I kind of, you know, I'll use the term prophecy in tongue-in-cheek a bit, you know, to say that... Uh, there is a Maya prophecy for 2012, and it's found in the Maya creation mythology. And it's basically that at the end of the cycle, the vain and false ruler, Seven Macaw, will appear. This, I think, is also an insight into the nature of cycles as they manifest in, in human experience in the realm of uh, the glo human civilizations and societies evolving. That It seems like at the end of a cycle, uh, uh, all the dark forces come out of the closet to rule and control and keep people in a state of limitation. Seven Macaw, who is supposed to appear at the end of the cycle, is the archetype of uh, vain and false egoism. So to the extent that we do see our world currently ruled by megalomaniacal egoism and corporations with short-term profit motives and controlling people and raping and pillaging for you know, uh, amassing wealth and so on, then it does seem that the Maya prophecy for 2012 has come true. And so uh, if that's represented by, uh, so what was his name? The bad Seven guy? Macaw. Seven Macaw. Then the hero twins, the good guy, uh, how are we going to see that come? What do you expect? Do you see, do you see a kind of a Quetzalcoatl return? Or something? Well, that, that's kind of the second part of the Maya prophecy, is that uh, there is the possibility of sacrificing seven macaw. That is equivalent to sacrificing our attachment to the illusions that keep us connected to this illusory net that seven macaw has woven to keep us in a state of limitation in our hearts and in our minds and our consciousness. So we can, you know, say that the emperor is wearing no clothes. You know, the, the, the hero twins are tricksters, actually, and they succeed in facilitating the downfall of seven macaw by tricking him. And uh, I think it's really a transformational image where seven macaw ego needs to be transformed into the true identity. Or you might say it a different way, that seven macaw ego needs to be put back into right relationship with the true eternal self. Um, okay. So, one second. Okay. This, this transformation, 2012, you're, you're saying that uh, it, it looks more like a transformation than a doom state, I think. There, there doesn't seem to be so much in the, in the idea of the mind uh, prophecy of a doom state. It's more about a rebirth and transformation. Um, looking at the world the way we're looking at right now, seeing what's happened, you open the window and there's cars driving by and oil and pollution and blah, 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 corruption. Um, you know, mind prophecy aside, in order to change and, and get back on track and start being more, you know, in harmony with the earth, uh, do we need to wipe the slate clean? I mean, can, can we transform without just destroying everything? Do we need cataclysm? No, I don't think we do. Um, I think that uh, all change in the material world happens within the spiritual heart first. That, uh, I mean, certainly we can 
be working towards you know spir- you know political change or or changing institutions. But though that all that's going to be just band aids on the problem, unless we really change the situation in in the heart, and that has to begin with the individual. So yeah, I don't think we need a quote global cataclysm, you know. Uh, for this to happen, but it might be part of the script of the Judeo-Christian tradition, of which we are the the, the result, uh, to have some kind of dramatic apocalyptic change kicking us in the butt. But even so, uh, I do believe that uh, there are already seed groups of people emerging that already can understand the changes that need to take place, you know, the shift of values that need to play, take place, away from this ego-obsessed dominator ethic that's uh, ruling and ruining the planet, to set up different ways and systems of doing things that are more partnership-oriented and oriented towards uh, systems of, you know, sustainability. And uh, I don't really know the answers to all these things. All, all these kinds of uh, questions are sort of like, speculative social philosophy or something like that. I, I just know that what I can do in, in my own process is to work on uh, you know, creating a, a better connection with, with my own truth and integrity within and, and be working in, the, in, in my relations with people to uh, you know, build bridges and make connections and uh, it all gets very far away from just the tangible work of, and maybe it's just obscure, or it'll probably after 2012 be seen as, you know, just the work of obscure scholars or something working on Maya inscriptions or something. But I, I think that where where there's a real possibility of positive change around this, um, assuming that the world isn't going to blow up in 2012, is that the indigenous Maya people can uh, gain new ground in, in their sovereignty in Guatemala, places like Guatemala. And there are Maya leaders today, like Victor Montejo, that talk about the 2012 Bakhtunian movement uh, as a time when the Maya, can, uh, Maya leaders and Maya uh, 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 speakers can... Um, Take places of uh, greater places of control in their communities. I think that's that would be sort of an indication of greater egalitarian uh, relationship between the Maya and the modern world. Um, <clears throat> well, one thing that the Mayans uh, seem to have that we don't is uh, ha- had that we don't is uh, is a kind of uh, a connection with a deep source of knowledge is something that we've mm-hmm. lost. I mean, not just the Mayans, all ancient cultures, the Egyptians, mm-hmm. so, so yeah. had something going on. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps we could call it a shamanic knowledge, not knowledge of this other realm where there's a deep source of information and there's something really to be learned there. Um, so we've divorced from this you know, entirely. Yeah. How, how do we get it back? I mean, is it possible? Yeah, that's, uh, that's really uh, what's so amazing about the Maya culture and other culture, ancient cultures around the world is that they actually seem to have had a kind of a multi-dimensional understanding of the universe. They had an acknowledgement of this multi-dimensional ecologies of beings and domains of nature that were all interrelated and interconnected. I think that's using the human mind to its fuller capacity because our, our minds are multi-dimensional. There's, there's a saying that we are multidimensional beings who have settled for a lot less. And I think that Western civilization typifies this situation. We live in the reign of quantity where everything's been reduced and flattened out to only acknowledging the surface of reality. So shamanism and other uh, types of activities can be involved in what might be called an awakening to the fuller capacity of the human mind. But it's good, when that happens, and I think it is happening, why not create our institutions of our society in such a way to reflect an acknowledgement of those realms? You know, the, these realms, uh, I think it's useful to have Uh, sort of communication channels open between these different realms. The realm of, say, depth psychology. Uh, The Maya would call it communicating with the ancestors. Uh, I think it's a healthier uh, psychological and spiritual uh, situation for those channels to be open. And probably the tools of traditional shamanism can really be used with good effect to this. 
like healing work done with uh, sacred plants, psilocybin mushrooms, ayahuasca, uh, these kinds of things, which are demonized in, in the modern legal system. I think the revolution needs to happen from within societies, and I hope we will become a more enlightened uh, civilization and society around these substances in the years to come. I think it, it's, it's, it's like the way that progress happens in ac academia. Progress in academia happens funeral by funeral. As the old vanguard passes away, who are so stuck to their previous views, in, the, in a similar way, I think that society will be transformed just by the new the new generations coming up. But we have to empower and support these progressive ideas in in the new generations that's coming coming. And so, I think it's it's a good thing. You know, I think that there is a, an opening uh, happening in society, in which we will have a more expanded. Uh, uh, and progressive attitude towards ourselves as human beings and our relationship to each other and to the cosmos. Okay, one thing I just wanted to get because we missed it is, is the idea of uh, this 2012 not being a day but a window. Oh, yeah, Sorry. yeah. In, in the calendar, in the long count calendar, with the correlation that we know, uh, we can say that the end of the 13 Bakhtun cycle falls on a specific day. It's just part of the mechanics of the calendar. So... December 21st of 2012, according to the correlation that you know is confirmed by the surviving Zolkin count in the highlands of Guatemala and so on. But uh, to, the, to the extent that 2012 is talked about as some kind of transformation, I don't think we can think of it as some kind of definitive thing that's going to happen exactly on that day. You know, I just don't think that it's something that's built into the architecture of time in that way. Uh, so the alignment itself, the galactic alignment, doesn't happen specifically and only on December 21st of 2012. It's, it's such a slow process that you'd have to really think about a, what I like to think about as a 36-year window. Uh, but that, again, doesn't imply that uh, everything's going to happen inside of that 36-year window. You know, We have to become more sophisticated in how we think about uh, the 2012 tradition. Um, one thing about 2012 is that some people are saying okay, if this is going to happen, if this whole massive transformation is going to take place, then maybe more should be going on in the world. You know, the period that we've had over the past few years, yes, there's been a lot of stuff, there's been earthquakes and, you know, war and whatever, but, you know, that stuff was happening in, the, in mm -hmm. World War II, in the 70s, and it's always been going on. Mm -hmm. if, if we really are approaching a massive, massive shift and transformation in, in the, perhaps the way we live our lives, then shouldn't we see something else going on? Shouldn't we see more sign of it, perhaps? Uh, I think that, well, one sign might be just all of the change with technology, the acceleration of technological change that we see happening. You know, that's a very human phenomenon. It's something that's being extruded from consciousness, you know, as we, as we go forward. And um, I think that's maybe a good indication that there's something strange happening on the planet right now, technological change, acceleration of, you know... Uh, uh, satellite technology, computers, that information technology, that kind of thing. Okay, makes sense. So yeah. finally, um, um, what's do you have like a, a kind of quintessential <clears throat> message or a legacy you'd like to leave for mankind? You know, what, <laughs> what would that be? Well, uh, hmm, wow. Uh, I guess just on a simple level that we can look to the ancient cultures, cultures like the Maya, for genuine wisdom. These cultures were, I. I believe that they were in touch with a perennial wisdom or perennial philosophy that we in the modern world as inheritors of this Western civilization, Western culture, have been cut off from. We've been cut off from the connection to the big, the big picture. And so we should really look to uh, getting back in touch with the wisdom that the ancient civilizations had. That's not to overly romanticize ancient civilizations. But uh, that we always have the possibility of opening up to a, a greater consciousness. And, uh, and also that uh, the, the Maya people were advanced in ways that we can barely understand, you know, because we're kind of stuck inside this uh, smaller consciousness. And uh, so the challenge, I think, is to open up to dealing with the Maya information on its own terms. And it, it probably requires... Doing, one, doing work oneself with opening up to 
a kind of higher consciousness or more expanded consciousness because when we can have an understanding of those kinds of states of consciousness, then we can, I think, truly understand the kind of mind frame that the ancient Maya were in.